Welcome back into the Original Gangsters podcast. I am your co-host, Scott Bernstein. Uh, this week, we are going to do a, uh, a bit of a deep dive into uh, legacy in the uh, outlaw biker culture. We're going to do an immemorial episode for the two biggest uh, Hells Angels uh, biker bosses in history, uh, RIP to Sonny Barger and Mom Boucher, who both died in the last couple of weeks. I want to welcome in my co-host and co-conspirator, the Dr. Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. Thank hey you. And I uh, just want to remind everyone, please uh, subscribe to our podcast, subscribe to our video channel on YouTube, follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And also just um, for newer audience members, we get feedback on social media, and I appreciate that about different ideas for themes and topics we should talk about. And sometimes those uh, ideas, they're always really good suggestions, but sometimes um, we all, we've we already produced episodes on that topic. So I, I encourage everyone, if, especially if you're a newer audience member, to dig through our, our archives. Uh, we don't have the archives up on YouTube yet, but if you go to Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcast and scroll through those episodes, you'll see every episode we've ever produced and all the different topics that we've we've talked about. So uh, please do that. And even if uh, you're a longtime listener, maybe you missed something, uh, scroll through there and listen to it, and please spread the word. Thanks. So, Jimmy, let's, uh, let's jump right into the deep end of the pool. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know if it's appropriate. Uh, it's, it's definitely of note that the two most iconic Hells Angels in American history, uh, both, or I should say North American history, um, both died in the same couple weeks. Sonny Barger, Ralph Sonny Barger, uh, is the, you know, the architect of modern day biker culture, period. He founded the Hells Angels uh, in the late 1950s. And what we have in 2022 as, you know, the, the picture of what, uh, those one, those one percenters are, uh, the guys with, with, the uh, hundreds of, of brothers, uh, draped in, in colors and flags and rockers, uh, spread around the country. Uh, there are, there are literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of them. And it all started with Sonny Barger, uh, out of Oakland, California in the late 1950s. And he grew the Hells Angel into really the standard bearer for uh, all biker gangs uh, and, and biker organizations around the world. Yeah, I think he's really significant for a lot of ways. I mean, first of all, he really turned the Hells Angels into a franchise. It wasn't just about a local motorcycle club. He really um, helped really brand it as something that was really cool. If you were into that culture, if you were a biker, yeah. if you were an outlaw, if you were a troublemaker. And Hollywood <laughs> celebrated it early on. Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, he started the Hells Angels in 1957. By the mid-60s, late 60s, they were being included in, in uh, movies and television shows and uh, touring around with rock groups as their security. Uh, they were very uh, immersed and me meshed. Is that a word? Yeah. Uh, into into the pop culture fabric pretty early on. Yeah. I mean, movies like, um, well, there was, there was a Hells Angels movie, right? And, yeah. and Sonny, he actually, didn't he get some kick, um, pushback from some of the other members? They, didn't, they weren't happy about that? Uh, I, I think th there were uh, tensions between Sonny and certain members of the rank and file and certain members of the... Uh, uh, the power structure within his organization over the years. Yeah. Um, and, and it wasn't just one, one issue. I think it was a, a, a common theme when, when you, when you build something and it becomes as, as giant and has the imprint that the hell's angels uh, had both in terms of presence in outlaw biker culture around the world, but also in terms of, like you said, making money off of the brand. Um, yeah, Hell's for, Angel for 69 licensing. Is, the, is the name of the film. And um, for licensing purposes or, um, you know, any type of um, inclusion in uh, mainstream media fare uh, uh, brought, brought money. And Sonny Barger was in 
the film and he plays Sonny, but I've never seen the film. I'm embarrassed to say it actually sounds cool. It sounds like an exploitation era flick from, uh, you know, 69. And, um, uh, I, I don't know if he's, if it's like sort of biographical, autobiographical, what he's playing, but, but anyhow, it's just another example. Then we know the infamous Rolling Stones incident, which by the way, listen to our, um, interview with George Christie. Altamont. Yeah. Concert he really where, breaks uh, that down. Uh, but, but that was, and that was an, another example of where the Hells Angels crossed over with popular culture. But in some ways, in that case, you know, maybe it was like infamy. <laughs> and that was one of the first. <laughs> that went really bad. And I think one of that it's probably one of the first times that the 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 public, uh, the the regular Joe and Jane Q American citizen, were were learning about who the Hell's Angels were, uh, yeah. especially if you weren't from the the West Coast. Yeah, uh, you definitely knew who the Rolling Stones were. But maybe you didn't know who the Hell's Angels were until you read the account of what happened at that uh, that faithful that fateful uh, day um, where where uh, life was lost and uh, uh, there was a, a altercation on b- between Marty Ballin, who was the lead singer of Jefferson Starship, and the Hell's Angels. Yeah, um, yeah, that was a that ended up being a bad mix, and um, you can listen to our episode with George. He really it gives a really good outline to it, but. Um, I think the the Jefferson airplane guy told the the biker go fuck himself, and he gave him an opportunity. I remember in the interview, George says the the biker told him take it back, <laughs> and he wouldn't take it back. And so then I uh, I think he knocked him out, and then um you know they got on they got pretty uh physical with the crowd, and then someone ends up getting stabbed to death. Someone yeah I think he had a gun the the so, somehow. You know, security was different back then. An audience member had a gun, and he pulled it, and the the biker, the Hell's Angels. But there had been problems that entire yes. uh, day, uh, that entire concert. Uh, there had been issues between the Hell's Angels and the people at the concert, and th- this was kind of the culmination of that. Yeah, and that's actually a really interesting dynamic that we don't have to— And Sonny Barger was there, yes. by the way. Yeah, he was present I don't when think, that happened. I don't think George was, but he, he knew about it. He's, he was around those guys. I think it was a little bit before his time, but um, anyhow. Th- and then there ended up being what we reported on our podcast. There ended up being a dispute yeah. between the Rolling Stones and the Hell's Angels. They didn't want to pay. Was, who was paying the lawyer fees and the uh, legal uh, you know, punishment um, from the courts right. uh, about uh, insurance payouts and whatnot? Yeah. Who was footing the bill for that? The Stones wouldn't pay, and Mick Jagger got his uh, his his yacht blown up uh, in in uh, harbor. Yeah, and in they New put York, a they New put York. a contract yeah. on on him, and they uh, actually confronted. I think at one point, Mick Jagger's bodyguard and and the Hell's Angels pretty much kicked the shit out of the guy, and then and then I think the FBI ended up getting to Jagger and was like. You you should settle these accounts. Like well, the, 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 I think this the is guy, not a joke. One Don't of the trifle guy, with these guys. I, I think one of the guys, if not the guy, that had been tapped for the contract flipped. Yeah, I think it was a guy from Cleveland. That's how they right. Um, who That's became how the one of the first big uh, informants or well known informants or witnesses against against the Hell's Angels, and that's what might have ultimately prevented. Uh, uh, the murder of <laughs> Mick Jagger by the Hell's Angels over what happened at Altamont, the fallout. Yeah, because they weren't going to let that go. And and one thing I was going to say is kind of interesting. We don't have to deep dive it, but sociologically, it's interesting. You were talking about the this being a bad mix of the, the Hell's Angels with like the hippies, and because you know we talk about the counterculture. Obviously, it was way before our time, but when you study it, late '60s, early '70s, um. Sometimes we just lump it into this one major category of of counterculture, but not all the different subcultures within the counterculture were compatible with each other. So you had like the anti-war hippies and pot smokers didn't necessarily sync well with outlaw bikers. So you had Black Panthers and you had had like it was pretty diverse range of. And so in this case, like the hippies. And the and Hell's Angels weren't really like yeah. a, combat, a, a compatible. They're more combustible. Yeah, more, even though they were both technically counterculture. And Barger, uh, it, it wasn't just the movie. Barger, I believe, in either the 80s or the 90s, he wrote a book 
which I guess you could uh, analogize in the mafia to like Joe Bonanno writing a book. I think some people were aggravated by that. Um, and so, yeah, he, he embraced his celebrity and uh, he, he was such a, an American pioneer. Um, and, and that's a credit to him. But he was also a criminal. Uh, he was, uh, you know, the, the epitome of what a biker boss was. It, he he spread the Hells Angels, like I said, not just around America or North America, but uh, around around the world. Um, he eventually became an actor. Uh, he was in he was in Sons, Sons of Anarchy, of Anarchy yeah. playing Lenny the Pimp. Uh, so, but I want to make a, a delineation between him and then the guy we're also going to talk about who was the, the, the Sonny Barger of Canada, um, uh, Maurice, uh, mom Boucher. Um, one of the differences is that Sonny Barger died a free man. Um, mom Boucher, uh, from Montreal died in prison of throat cancer, been locked up the last two decades. Uh, but I think there is a uh, a distinct difference in them where Sonny was a biker boss while Maurice Mamboucher uh, evolved, I would say, from a biker boss to a crime lord and a uh, uh, an underworld head of state, uh, more so than Sonny Barger ever did and that's no disrespect to barger or the legacy because his legacy is is just huge and what he was able to build and spawn from his vision of of uh, a, a biker organization and just brilliant really um but I, I think when we're talking about mom boucher uh whose story really begins in the 70s and 80s as, as opposed to barger's who's, who begins in the 50s um you're talking about that kind of a different beast yeah i would say is that um, Sonny always kept one foot in the mainstream. Even though he was an outlaw and he was counterculture icon, like you said, the movies, the books, he always kept one foot in the mainstream, and um, even though he was an outlaw to the core, whereas Mom Boucher was a gangster. Yeah. <laughs> like straight, straight gangster. And Sonny was in and out of prison on, on a lot of drug cases. Yeah. Um, not to say that he wasn't ever implicated in violence. He was, uh, there, you know, he, he was implicated in, in, in murders, I believe. Um, but mom Boucher, like you said, playing off, uh, your categorization of him as a, as a gangster, he, he was an arch villain criminal that was, uh, putting out hits on police officers and, per, uh, uh, per, per, parole officers. Um, yeah. he, he was, a a, a, a walking, talking, lethal weapon of a human being. And again, I'm not trying to say that Sonny Barger wasn't a, a, a dangerous person. He was, of course, but, uh, I, I think mom Boucher, at least when it came to the country of, of Canada, um, the government viewed Mom Boucher a lot differently than the government of the United States viewed Barger. Yeah, I think so. And I, I also, I think my, my understanding is that the Hells Angels in the United States was a little bit more decentralized in the sense that Sonny Barger obviously carried a lot of weight and he was the OG, but um, he wasn't the, you know, the Kabuti Tutti copy like, the, the, each Hell's Angels chapter had a lot of autonomy, even if Sonny was certainly a presence and, and is, it loomed large. But uh, whereas my understanding is that at least in uh, Quebec, that Mom Boucher was the shot caller. I of would the, say in the entire country, the other, yeah, there was no more powerful biker boss, yeah, uh, than than yeah, because that was the center of power was yeah. Montreal and that 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 so his era, Sonny, his area. Sonny died on June 29th. Um, Mom died uh, last week. Um, let me get a date on Mom Boucher. I was just looking at your article on this. He died uh, July 10th, I think. So they were about 10 days apart, roughly. Uh, so that, to, That's weird. So, so to give people a, a little bit of more insight on Mom Boucher, uh, he was a biker in Canada in the 70s with a, a, a biker group that had some 
uh, national nationalism ties, uh, some Nazi neo Nazi ties. There was a group called the SS, right? And uh, when Barger decided to expand the Hell's Angels brand outside of the American borders. Uh, one of the first places he went to was to Canada and uh, put a chapter in, in Montreal in um, uh, the, the late 1970s. And a lot of the uh, smaller, uh, less influential groups uh, like the SS were absorbed and, and patched over. Uh, so let's talk about that for a minute. Cause that's interesting how, how the, um, if the Hells Angels of the United States want to expand, they don't just set up a sign and have people fill out applications, right? They 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 identify potential it's recruits. Like, th think about it as a like a business. Yeah, right. You know, a, a, right. Cor a corporation that doesn't have a presence in a certain city will target that city and then go buy up all the mom and pop spots from yeah. that city and and take them underneath their umbrella and all of a sudden you got blockbuster video. Yeah, right. So it's kind of interesting. And for for and, people that don't know that analogy, yeah, when we were younger, well, they don't know <laughs> before you were streaming all your movies. Yeah, right. You were going to a what? Really, at the end, there was one place to go get all your videos. Yeah. They had a monopoly. What's blockbuster video again. <laughs> yeah, That's our producer Ben, who was, I'm just kidding. I was uh, around. I was. Around. You would have been a little dude. I was with, uh, about <laughs> ten when uh, Blockbuster was uh, going under. And then family video lasted a little while, but not. But the, the point <laughs> is, there was a point in time where there were all of these mom and pop spots uh, that were selling yeah, videos. That's how it started. And then by the the nineties, yeah. Blockbuster had come into every city right. in the world and right. just planted a flag. Right. And Barnes they all and Noble did that with bookstores. Right. They There's all just came under underneath. Uh, uh, the blockbuster banner, and th that's what happened with the Hell's Angels in uh, Montreal and a lot of other places where yeah. they just they pa they call it's called patching over, right? And it, it's interesting the politics of it because it can go two ways. Like in a lot of cases, the local club is honored, and they're like, "Fuck yeah!" Like right. big leagues, like we yeah. we we're, we're down. We're but then you have sometimes you have the local clubs are like, "No, we're good." And that doesn't usually go over. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't go over very well. It with, offends. It offends yeah, the, right. the bigger group that's coming right. in. The, in their mind, they're offering you value in right. their, uh, right. you know, their co-signing. Yeah, and if you if you kind of turn that down or say you're not interested, that usually doesn't go over very well. And then it turns into like, well, we're we're not asking. Like if you if you want to continue to exist, <laughs> you will exist as Hell's Angels, or you won't. You will no longer exist. And you know what that. Yeah, you know what that means. So uh, with Boucher, it, it appears that his his rise in the organ in the organization was was quite meteoric. Uh, he got initiated or patched in, uh, I believe, in according to court records and informants in, in 1984, uh, he had allegedly committed the murder of a, a an out an out a member of the outlaws. Um, which is the, the, the Hells Angels' big rival, or the Outlaws, which is a, a Midwest-based uh, biker organization, Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee. Um, and uh, they also have a presence in Canada. And according to these court records, uh, Mom Boucher murdered uh, a president of the Outlaws and was rewarded with membership in the Hells Angels. And then within a year, I believe, he was named president of the Montreal Hells Angels. Um, and then there was this, uh, split between him and a, a, a group of bro uh, or two brothers that he was very close with, that he had come up in the SS with and had patched over into the Hells Angels with, uh, the Cazetta, Cazetta brothers, uh, Salvatore and Giovanni and, uh, uh, Salvatore Cazetta was, not pleased with the direction of the Hells Angels in Canada. There was a, a, a mass murder uh, that took place, I think, in 1984 or in that 83 or 84, where you had Hells Angels turning on other Hells Angels. And the Cazettas um, decided they didn't want to be a part of that type of organization. So they started their own group called The Rock Machine. And this was in 19. 85 and uh 
there were copacetic uh, relations between the rock machine and the Hells Angels for a period of time until uh, Salvatore Cassetta, well, Cassetta, Cassetta uh, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I could be butchering it. Uh, it would be uh, Cassetta, but Cassetta's fine. So he's imprisoned in 1994. Uh, on a drug case and all hell breaks loose. And in a lot of ways, it's, it's a, a table setter or a precursor, an appetizer to what is going on right now in Canada with the mafia that have, uh, there's been this cataclysmic biblical, uh, you know, there's biblical proportions of a mob war going on right now and has been going on for over a decade in Canada. And a lot of this was kind of foreshadowed by what happened in the biker world uh, between 1994 and 2002 uh, because Mom Boucher viewed uh, Salvatore Cazetta's removal from the scene uh, as a entree to take over uh, all drug dealing, uh, all, all all gambling, all uh, loan strip sharking. Clubs, a lot of, the bikers are really in the strip clubs. Uh, in in Montreal. And it didn't matter that Salvatore Casado was an old friend of his. didn't matter that uh, they had come up together in, in, a, in the SS. They had joined the Hells Angels together. Uh, it was a, a pure power grab. And you, you had more than 100 bodies drop in those eight years. And right now you're going on 12, 13 years of uh, the, you know, one has been dubbed the great Canadian biker war or the great Quebec biker war. This is being dubbed the great Canadian mob war. Uh, you're, you're already into the uh, hundreds, uh, well into the hundreds in what's been going on with the mafia in the last decade plus. And what, what, what went down between 94 and 02 was, uh, you know, almost equally as bloody and uh, Mom Boucher ended up going to prison uh, for activity that took place during that war, but he would last for six years on the outside uh, between 94 and 2000, and in that time period, he became a folk hero to a degree, and, and, and you know, Sonny Barger did too, to an extent, but... Uh, Boucher was a Teflon Don for for a period of time. He kept on beating cases. Yeah, the, you ever see the footage of him? Like he, he, it's like John Gotti comes yeah. out, everyone's cheering Everyone's for him, and, and he, there's there's an actual. Uh, <laughs> he's got all his entourage. Yes, and there was an actual um, event or or incident that happened that really solidified this or cemented this in uh, Canadian pop culture. Uh, he's put on trial for, for a, a gangland double homicide. He beats it, uh, beats the case in, I think, I believe it was 1998 or 1997. And uh, the night that he beats the case, uh, he's, he'd been held without bond for a year or two. So he hadn't been free. He gets free, beats the case and he goes to a Roy Jones who at the time was one of the big yeah. boxers of the era. He goes to a Roy Jones Jr. boxing uh, match, yeah. and uh, the whole crowd stands up and applauds him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So he lasted for another two years. They eventually nailed him, um, I believe, on, on, ha on the homicides that were tied to these police officers. He became public enemy number one. Prison, gu well, prison guards, yeah. uh, parole officers, and policemen it. were ending up dead at his yeah. order. Well, and th there's... That that was a that was a game changer, but um, because up until that point they had not been targeting members of the state. Yes, and at that point there was a fear that if if they pull this off and we don't the the state RCMP and others we don't respond, they're gonna. Th there was a real fear that they would turn. Montreal into like Colombia yeah. or Sicily, where they're, where they're assassinating yeah. prosecutors and judges, and so they they really felt like they had to put the smack down, and he was public enemy number one throughout Canada, and uh, it also scared authorities uh, of his very very close relationship with Vito Rizzuto. Yeah, uh, it was like this, uh, you know, alliance of the uh, uh, the axis of evil. 
um, where you have the most powerful, the two, really, the two most powerful criminal figures in all of Canada coming from different uh, spaces within that underworld that came together and, and joined forces. And uh, you could make the argument, and that we were talking about this off, uh, off mic, that if Mom Boucher doesn't go to prison in 2000 and he's on the street when Vito Rizzuto does go to prison in the later 2000s and is shipped off to America to serve his his prison sentence. And while he's in prison in America, his own organization craters and uh, his own people turn against him and start killing members of his own family and everything erupts into chaos that has yet to cease. Uh, again, 13, 14 years later, uh, n- none of this might have happened if Mom Boucher had been free and was there to, you know, uh, do Vito Rizzuto's bidding for him while he was on the outside. I think I think that's a good that's a good point. Um, and and to, to talk about that relationship for a moment, <clears throat> the okay, why why are the bikers and the Italians working together? Well, a lot of this came about with drug distribution. The the bikers. The Italians were supplying the bikers with especially cocaine, but other things, heroin, but especially cocaine. And the Italians, and even now, the same thing in Detroit and other places, the Italians don't like to wholesale. Like, they don't like to to sell on the street and, like, hand-to-hand deliveries and things like that. And so the bikers are a good strategic partner for the Italians if you're bringing in a lot of cocaine and heroin and just sort of dump it off to the bikers, and then let them worry about distributing it. There's um, all, and there's maybe always, wholesale is not the right word. I was thinking of like distribution. They don't like yeah. the Italians. Don't like to get they into don't distribution. Like getting their hands. Done. They don't like yeah. getting their yeah. hands right. No, there's always <laughs> been a. I shouldn't say always, but dating back to the 1970s, so going back 50 years, there has been a symbiotic relationship between Italian organized crime and outlaw biker organized crime. And it it's it doesn't discriminate. Uh, it's been happening in Los Angeles. It happens in New York. Happens in Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee, Florida. Uh, it, it happens all over the place, Boston. And uh, there's always been a a kind of trading of services, if you will. And the mob has liked and has gotten used to and and feel comfortable outsourcing a lot of their dirty work yeah. a lot of the dirtiest work there yeah. is to be done out uh, in in the underworld yeah. to these bikers and the bikers like just like we were talking last week about the the African American drug lords uh in the 70s and and 80s seeing the having an Italian supply yeah. supply line as a as a status. status symbol i think it's it's similar with the biker guys if they have a italian mob guy that they can call uh uh as as their you know their number two in a situation or even if they're number two to their you know in if they could broker a deal or if they can uh anything that can and uh, they can let they can there's a lot of different situations they could leverage for their own organization, their own biker group, by an affiliation with the Italians. Yeah, so you, the Italians benefit from the the bikers can distribute. And by the way, part of the, your your notion of the dirty work is, let's say if you're a street gang and you're trying to extort a mafia connected business, in, in in Canada, back then at least, you're probably not going to get a visit from the Italians. You're going to get a visit from the bikers. <laughs> Get a visit from the Hell's Angels, yeah. and they're going to inform you that this is a connected place, and you need to back. The well, we fuck saw off. it in Chicago <laughs> with a, with one of our uh, a guests from a, a year uh, about a year ago, uh, Big Pete. Um, you know the 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 so called O and O alliance, the Chicago outfit and the Outlaws, and in a case that involved the 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 Godfather of the Chicago Mafia, uh, Bi- uh, Fat Mike Sarno who uh, was actually in the headlines this past week because he got his appeal for compassionate yeah, release that. denied. But, you know, Big Mike, Fat Mike Sarno, not to be confused with Big Mike Spano, <laughs> Fat Mike Sarno um, was convicted of extorting a, a video poker machine company and a bar that was using that video uh, 
game uh, service for their uh, for the machines that were in their establishment. And uh, Sarno wanted that video poker machine company and that bar to use his video poker uh, his video poker machines, um, and they weren't. And and he wasn't asking, <laughs> right? And Sarno ended up blowing up uh, uh, a storefront. Yeah. But he also ended up sending the outlaws right. into that bar to tear the bar up. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's, again, this, it, it happens in Canada. It happens in the United States. It happens on the West Coast. It happens on the East Coast. It happens in the Midwest. And and the, and so then you think, okay, so what, what do the bikers get? Well, first of all, there's like that social status. But it's, it's really more substantive than that because the Italians, at least in Montreal and throughout Hamilton, uh, they had the political contacts. And infiltrated legitimate business world. So if you're the bikers, those connections are invaluable for money laundering, for political protection, for things like that. Uh, other opportunities to get into other rackets like construction and things like normally the bikers wouldn't be fucking with that kind of stuff. So the Italian, it's really important strategically for both sides to to work together. And and I think where, where there was a tension was, it reminds you of the, the Godfather a little bit with with drugs, but. Because there was so much violence between the Hells Angels and the Rock Machine, and the the Hells Angels now are thinking about well, they put a, they did put a contract out on a public official. That's when Vito Rizzuto had to step in and are yeah. like, th this this doesn't last. It's and not it's, sustainable. If, and it's bad for everybody. It's bad for everybody. And it's starting to blow back on me and my organization. Right, right. Like I can't. We can't protect you. Those political contacts yeah. and the money laundering and all that. That that can't continue. And if Vito Rizzuto squashed the beef. If you're right. Vito the Rizzuto had the power. Ha Vito Rizzuto had the power in 2002 the government went to, him. to step in yeah. and tell everyone to stand down. Yeah. And they did. Yeah. And, the, and it shows you how powerful Vito Rizzuto right, is. Right. And, and the government went to him and were yeah. like, like everyone's going down if you don't if you don't <laughs> put a stop And there to were this. there were actually, you know, there were two meetings. Uh, that took place, one publicly and one privately, uh, that I believe were both surveilled and there's photos of of uh, uh, Vito Rizzuto sitting at a table with uh, Mom Boucher on, on one side and then the leader uh, of the rock machine who at that time had gone and made an alliance with the banditos. Yeah. Um, and it was like rock machine banditos, Mom Boucher on one side, Vito Rizzuto playing Don Corleone in the middle. And, yeah. And they left that, they left that meal and shook hands and, and the violence stopped. Yeah, and the uh, and and from the Italians' perspective, also they're like you know everyone. There's enough money; everyone can make money because, you know, the the Italians did not have some kind of fidelity to the Hell's Angels. They didn't care who distributed <laughs> was distributing their narcotics. They'd be just as happy to supply the 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 rock machine, the Petitos, as the yeah. Hell's Angels. But they had this this you know it had been pre existing this relationship with the Hell's Angels. But one one of the things that was another game changer was not only. Because, you know, you talked about him being a folk hero. Once the public finds out that you took a contract out on a police official, or in this case, it was a, was a uh, was it a parole officer? Or was it a prosecutor? I can't remember. It was they were prison guards. Prison guards, yeah. Okay, now now you're going you're gonna to chip away significantly at your public support and your, like, Robin Hood image. But the, the one that was even bigger than that was there was an assassination attempt on a biker with a car bomb. And a 10-year-old boy was killed. He was like, uh, I don't know, he's riding his skateboard, riding his bike or something like that. I can't remember. I'm going to tell you. And um, that's when the public opinion officially turned on Mom Boucher from being like a folk hero to, like, we don't want our country to turn into, like, you know, what we see in Sicily or Colombia or Mexico where civilians and public officials are getting killed. If the gangsters are killing each other, people can turn a blind eye to that. But once civilians or police start getting caught up in the crossfire, um, usually public opinion is going to change pretty quickly. I mean, that, that, and that, that happened in Italy, too, you know, with, with Falcone. Yep. I mean, that, that was a big, the, the big prosecutor. When they assassinated him, there was sort of enough is enough, you know. I'm having a hard time finding uh, uh, the, the, the breakdown of... The kid that was yeah that was a sad that was a sad um 
case study. I don't know if I don't have it in my notes or uh, I don't want to have dead air. Right. But uh, so, I'll look it up. you know, it, I think it's also something to point out with Mom Boucher um, and, and differentiate him from Sonny Barger. He really was more in the mold of another contemporary of his that wasn't in the Hells Angels, but was the leader of the Outlaws, which was Harry Taco Bowman um, from Detroit and uh, the guy that really spread and expanded the Outlaw brand uh, both around the country and internationally. And Sonny Barger never really <sighs> molded his appearance or molded his behavior uh, to who he was speaking to or who he was meeting with. He was very unapologetic and didn't try to present a more polished version of himself. Uh, and then you look at Boucher, who started to behave like this in Canada at the same time that Bowman was behaving like this in America, where Bowman and Boucher cut their hair short, uh, would dress in, in a, a jacket and tie when they were meeting certain people. Uh, they, they were chameleons and knew how to interact more with the, the non-biker criminal elite and even the, the, the non-biker business elite. Uh, it, it was more of a seamless transition into those nooks and crannies of those relationships that really benefited the organi both of their respective organizations, the Hells Angels when it came to Boucher and the Outlaws when it came to Bowman, um, with that approach. And that was, with, with uh, Canada at least, <clears throat> that was by design. And we talked about off uh, air, um, the guy they called Nurgit, who was, a lot of people don't realize that. Walter like, Stadnick. Yeah, like, like Mom Boucher, it wasn't a dictatorship. I mean, there were, there were other heavyweights. It was a very political... I mean, they all made it work, but um, he he was sort of the more, uh, what do you want to say, like politician of the of the. Uh, well, Ner Nergit, I didn't want to be out in front of the, the right. newspapers. He was glad to let Mom Boucher take the, kind of the again. Arrows. This this makes him a little bit more like Bulger and less like Taco. Uh, Taco didn't court the headlines. Uh, Barger and Boucher, you know, courted yes. media attention. Right. And and Stadnick didn't want to have, I, I think Stadnick had like a, uh, I, excuse me if I'm if I'm speaking uh, false information here, but I, I think Stadnick had like a a scar on his face or something that made him um, scary looking, and avoided pictures. He yeah. didn't want his picture taken because of yeah. some vanity. He was a lot more low key and. Uh, because of this fear of, I guess, being judged on his looks, I think there was also some just being smart as a criminal wanting to insulate yourself. There was a decision made that although Stadnik might have had, at times, equal uh, power and status as Boucher, it was strategically decided that Boucher would be yeah. out in the public, in the public sphere. Yeah, and he yeah, he was more comfortable with it. but But... Uh, the other guy, um, he was the one who wanted the guys to be more clean cut. Stadnik? Yeah. Not, not look like heavy metal rock band guys. Not, by the way, not, not wear your cut in public right. and things like that. And, um, uh, be more buttoned, you know, buttoned up. And, uh, there was a little bit of pushback between, you know, with some of the rank and file, you know, this sort of like. Well, what the fuck, man? More like the Sonny Barger, like, hey, and we're outlaws. Like, we, we. But George Christie kind of took on that. Oh, yeah. That same posture yeah. in America yeah, for right. the Hells, uh, Hells Angels in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, where he kind of jumped in front of Sonny Barger yep. and said he was a little bit more of a uh, more digestible, yes. I think, by the mainstream public. He, he carried the torch. Yeah, we yeah, interviewed it, him. Yeah. You, know, you, can, you can listen to it in our archives. But he carried the torch in the 1984 Olympics. I mean, the city of LA was comfortable with the face of the, you know, Southern California yeah. 
uh, Hell's Angels being a part of the 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 torch yeah. lighting process. Yeah. So if you so if you if you if you find value in that, and that was a PR coup, of course. Yeah. And he, and, and he talks about that. And and so I think to a certain extent that that's part of the strategy in Canada too is. I like your term. You're going to be more digestible, which means less heat, more public support. Um, but if that doesn't matter, if you're putting contracts out on state officials and if, and if 11 year old boys are getting killed in the in the crossfire, um, that's only going to go so far. I'm looking at a. I found a newspaper article here from the Washington Post. I think it was 1995. Was when the was that when the uh, Oh, Boy I see it. Killed. August 9th, 1985. Yeah. 11-year-old bystander is killed by the shrapnel from a bomb used to kill uh, uh, Mark Duby, who was a, a Hells Angel affiliate. Right. Blown up in a car bomb uh, right outside of Hells Angels headquarters in Montreal, August 9th, 1995. So I think it was uh, Daniel Desrochers. Yes. I think how you pronounce his name. I see that now. It was early on in that war. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Cazetta goes to prison, I think, in the summer of 94, and uh, I think you had murders that took place in uh, July, October, and it was kind of off to the races at that point uh, with tensions uh, brewing between the Hells Angels and the Rock Machine. And um, remember, at one point, they also tried to kill a journalist. Yeah. And he, the person survived, but I think... He might have even taken some shots. So there were some other, they were breaking that kind of uh, traditional underworld code that civilians and journalists, law enforcement just look, are. Just look, I mean, we'll show it on, on our, our video, but you know, just look at this picture of Mom Boucher in one of his mug shots. Yeah. You, you could put this mug shot up in front of someone and yeah. say, identify this guy. Is this guy a, a white collar criminal? Yeah. Or is he a biker boss? And you could be like, oh, he kind of looks like a white collar criminal. He just doesn't yeah, look at all like, no. like a biker boss. He doesn't even look like a criminal. He right. looks like he could be he a dentist like, or something. Right, like a dentist or a... <laughs> uh, or, you know, he runs your local uh, tavern and, and pours, you your, pours you your drinks at night. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you look at Sonny Barger, though, oh, in, yeah. in his he, heyday, yeah. and he looked he looks like a part. biker boss. Yeah, he looks And, he look, and, he looks and Taco Bowman um, was uh, just so adept and so savvy in being able to tow, uh, have a, a foot in each one of those um, camps aesthetic, aesthetically. Because you see pictures of Taco Bowman uh, where he's all... Long hair, beard, tattoos, looking straight out of central casting, and then you look at a picture from him, uh, uh, a picture of him from six months after that last picture was taken, and his hair's cut short, and you can't see any tattoos, and his beard—he doesn't have a beard, and he's dressed in a three-piece suit going to meet with, you know, Jack Toco or who was a mafia down in Detroit, or going to uh, uh, meet with you know legitimate businesses that were doing business at that time with the outlaws, whether it be security. I know that the uh, early uh, Kid Rock, um, when when Kid Rock was getting started in the in the late '90s and was becoming a really big deal, uh, all of his personal security was done by the outlaws. Mm, I didn't know that. Um, so he luckily didn't go down like the Rolling Stones, right? <laughs> uh, situation, but. The difference is, though, I think Mom Boucher trying to look more respectable is still not the same thing as having a foot in the mainstream like Sonny did. So even though Sonny looked like an outlaw, he was out there. He's he's making movies. You got George Christie doing the 84 Olympics. I think that that's the big difference is Mom Boucher never, even if he was trying to appear as a more clean-cut dude, I don't think he was ever able to fully detached from the gangster shit and, Bo and boucher you know and I mean? bowman and circulate in respectable yeah. mainstream circles again kind of uh plain not devil's advocate's the wrong way to say it but count but uh, point counterpoint uh with bowman and boucher they had supreme loyalty to the day they died oh yeah you know the 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 rank and file uh, it, to the rank and file they were as beloved as beloved can be, yeah. they they checked the, those three boxes that I talk about in, in the underworld achieving power. Uh, it, it's so difficult to check three boxes. It's easy to check one or two of them, but to check all three: uh, loved, feared, 
respected. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to, to find all, someone that, that hits all three of those things. And, and Bowman and, and Boucher and, and Sonny Barger did too, but there were, there were more um, wrinkles, I think in, in Barger's legacy. Uh, and some of that has to do with, I think it's the size of the organization scale, that, he was, scale, that yeah. he was leading as opposed to the, the yeah. outlaws or even the, the Canadian hell's angels that Boucher was overseeing. Um, but, uh, and I'm sure if we had a, a Sonny Barger expert on here, he could sit here and debate me. And, and I would defer to him because I don't consider myself a Sonny Barger expert. But I think it does say something that at the end of Barger's life, um, he wasn't aff affiliated with the chapter that he started. He wasn't affiliated no, with the Oakland chapter. For a long time. He was down in Arizona. He started up. That's, um, he started there. Started up the Arizona um, uh, uh, Hells Angels and... You know, I, I think there were... And there, there was a beef between the chapter he started there and George Christie's... And George Christie the, the, the and Ventura. Ventura. Right. Yeah. So even within the club, there was some, some and, dissent. And so not to say that he wasn't a, a, a godlike figure um, in a lot of circles, because he was and is and, and deserved to be, if, if you were looking at it from that perspective. But uh, I think there was a, a little bit of a difference when it came to... Boucher and Bowman in terms of the way that everybody felt about them. Um, I think Barger definitely checked the uh, love, or I should say, I think he definitely checked the uh, feared and respected. Um, I, I'm, again, I'm not saying I'm an expert on, on Sonny Barger, but I don't know if everybody loved him. Yeah. And by the way, another uh, episode we did interview with Kerry Drobin, who wrote a book on the Phoenix uh, or Arizona Hells Angels. Uh, one of the things that was kind of interesting in that interview was she mentioned just as a coincidence that she lived in the same neighborhood as Sonny Barger. <laughs> she, she would see him all the time riding his motorcycle in the in the neighborhood, um, probably in Phoenix somewhere. Um, but I'll, I'll just I know we're all over the place in terms of the chronology here, but when we talk about a, a biker war. It really was a war in the sense of like if you if you think about like the the second great mafia war in Sicily in the in the early 80s they say it was a war but it wasn't really it was one sided Corleone with the, the, the Totorina they were killing everybody there was no retaliation they were the aggressors. it was just a it was just a massacre in this case it was a tit for tat like they were taking out hell's angels big time hell's too. big time hell's yeah, angels yeah yeah i mean it really was a back and forth um war so um, I don't know. I just think that's kind of an interesting no, was, difference that, to that point out. The the rock machine, while they were dwarfed in size and stature yeah. by the Hell's Angels, right? They kept up. They kept the fight. Oh, yeah. for eight years and held their that's own. Pretty remarkable. Um, like Did, didn't the rock machine form an alliance with the Outlaws too at some point, or is it just the Banditos? I wouldn't be shocked, uh, as we know, your enemy's enemy. Yeah, yeah, is your friend. Uh, the Outlaws and the Hells Angels have been at war since 1973 or 74. Um, there was an incident where three Hells Angels uh, from Massachusetts were killed down in Florida um, in like kind of a, a, a triple homicide. And that erupted this war that has yet to cease. Although if you listen to the George Christie interview... You know that there was a point in time in the nineties yeah. where the war was almost squashed, yeah. was almost uh put to bed. Yeah. And he uh, said he said Christy he liked was meeting he liked Taco. Christy personally. and Bowman had like a, a summit. Yeah. Where they met. There's pictures of it. Right. Where they <laughs> met for like a week trying to negotiate. And yeah. according to uh George Christie, a guy named Spike, um, I believe his name is Kevin O'Donnell, Spike O'Donnell, who was the boss of the Milwaukee Outlaws. Um, got into Bowman's ear and and kind of sabotaged it. Yeah, the, at the last second. But uh, well, you, that's an interesting thing because and we've talked about this with other you know biker topics that within the you could listen to our interview with Big P too, um, where this comes up the like inner politics of you know sometimes the leadership sees it as long term. Let's make money. <laughs> Violence is bad for business. business yeah. Let's keep things copacetic. And then you have like the guys on the street who are the guys who are, you know, sometimes getting into beefs with guys from other clubs. And it's like, you know, you get into the kind of like, uh, you know, reputation and status and we can't tolerate this and fuck these motherfuckers. And so 
you know, th- it's difficult to be a leader of a motorcycle club and try to keep like, you know, that 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 balance between, um, you know, let let's stay out of jail and make money, but at the same time you have your rep, and and how do you how do you balance that? I mean, it's pretty challenging. So, so just as we're winding down, just to give some people some uh, facts and figures, I guess uh, there was it was a female and a male prison guard uh, that were gunned down uh, three months apart back in 1997. So it wasn't just killing a prison guard; it was killing a female prison yeah, guard. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't just a contract; they actually killed. They actually killed them. Yeah, they didn't just take out the contract; they killed them. Um, but uh, there were, as we said, there were a lot of big name Hell's Angels and and Hell's Angel affiliates that uh, went went down in this war, uh, as well as uh, the the Cazetta brothers, a co-founder of the Rock Machine, Johnny Placio. Uh, who, a lot of Italian guys, by the way, who were bikers. Yeah, especially in Canada, which is kind of interesting. And uh, I know that you had a a guy that was a, a very distinguished member of of the Hell's Angels uh, in Canada named Biff uh, uh, Norman Biff Hamill, who was uh, one of Mom Boucher's right hand men. Uh, he was shot to death in the parking lot of a, a a doctor. He was going to his general practitioner for a, a checkup and. And, you know, people don't realize that, you know, the, the, the trade craft sometimes of, of uh, contract murders. And I can think of a couple off the top of my head in, in my studying of this where your, the nurse at your doctor's office or the nurse at your dentist's office unknowingly tips off your killers. Um, you know, with Danny Green, uh, they found out that he had a dentist appointment, the, the famous Irish mob boss of Cleveland. Who ends up getting uh, blown up in his in the in the parking lot of his dentist office? And his his rivals call the dentist office. They're like, "Yeah, we're Danny Green's uh, you know assistants, and we're looking to make sure where when his appointment is." Yeah, and uh, you know, so in this case, they, they killed Biff Hamill. Uh, they found out that he had a doctor's appointment, and uh, and they killed him. I, I can think of another situation in Chicago. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the guy where. Uh, they called uh, the guy's doctor's office and found out well, when he was going to show up, and they killed him in the uh, in the parking lot. Yeah, I mean, these days with you know privacy, these days any oh, any right. self respecting office would be like, we're not giving you that information. Right, right. Like like you can just hang it up. Remind, I don't know why I'm going to even bring this up, but it reminds me of we're talking about the difference between yesteryear and now. It reminds me of one of my grandpa's uh, buddies who who's a, a a bookmaker and professional gambler and he used to tell me stories uh how he would uh, this was like po- uh, pre-internet and uh how he would just call up uh athletic pro or like i would I, he's like i would call the university of michigan athletic department and say can you put me in touch with the training staff for the football team Oh. And the training staff would jump on the phone with him. Oh, so he could get insight. And so he could get insight on who was injured and who yeah. wasn't. So he can handicap and the then game. That, and, and then he would information pre- gets to Vegas, I right, bet. Right, right. No, and he said, he's <laughs> like, yeah, I would pretend I was so-and-so's uncle. On, and uh, I want to make sure that my nephew Tony's going to be playing <laughs> on Saturday so I don't drive all the way from Cleveland. Yeah. And they'd, they'd check it, and they would they would never, they wouldn't cross-check or or make him verify who he was. Yeah. And he's like, you'd have no, he's like, you have no idea how many times I was able to push the, the spread one way or the other yeah. based on just me cold calling the training department at certain, you know, big time football programs. Now you couldn't even get that person right. on the phone. Even right. if you, even if you legit, you'd probably yeah. have a difficult time getting them on the phone. Yeah. Let me ask you something before you wrap up. I'm looking at your article on Gangster Report. So in 1998, Paolo Catroni is killed by the rock machine. Now, that's it's interesting. A name, it's a name that you definitely Be- because recognize. Because Catroni, right, that's an important mafia name in, in Montreal. And um, the Catronis and the Rizzutos traditionally don't like each other. They coexist. Well, they, they don't now anymore, but at least because of the war you're talking about. But back in the day, for decades, they coexisted, even though they didn't like each other. Um, so if a control, if a Catroni was killed, I wonder what the Rizzuto reaction to that was, because on the one hand, there's a person who's part of your organization and you can't just allow people to pick off guys in your organization. Well, then, on look, the other hand, they don't really like them. But look what happened, uh, two years later in April of, of uh, 2000, you had a guy named Salvatore 
Gervasi, whose dad was a, a, a made guy of the Rizzuto family, Apollo Gervasi. So, but the, well, I guess but, he, but I the guess Rizzutos pa- took him out. Yeah. Well, so I get, okay, look. So it looks like Paolo Gervasi had, had thrown, thrown his support uh, behind the, the rock machine. When the Rizzutos said they wanted, yeah. they were support, officially supporting the Hells Angels, but. Um, but the Italians were definitely interwoven into this war. Well, another guy who he's not Italian, but he's definitely connected is you talk about 2000, Andre Desjardins. Yeah, big union, um, big union guy. Yeah, and he was his um Didi. Wasn't that his, him Didi. His, his brother is Ray is uh yeah, uh, 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 Re- Reynold. Yeah. Uh so at that point he was as about as high ranking non Italian member are we of sure? the Rizzuto, I mean, are, we sure? are we sure that he's related to to uh Desjardins that was Rizzuto's right hand? I don't want to say he is by not knowing for sure. I think so. I'll I'll fact check it. Because Desjardins is a pretty uh common French Canadian name. Yeah. I'm not doubting that he I, I that does sound familiar to me. I know that there was a a friend of Desjardins. Oh, you're, was, I, well, according to uh, the interweb, and we know the interweb is 100 percent right. true <laughs> that he's not that they're not related. Okay. So maybe. But not. I do know there was a. But the, he was still the Andre was still a big deal in his own right, even if he wasn't related to. And I know that uh, Reynaud Desjardins. Did I sound? Did that, was that a good? Fr- was that a good French? Mo- was that Desi- a good French Canadian? The, the, the last, That's very impressive. The last, the consonant is silent on the <laughs> yeah. last. So Desjardins. Desjardins. I know that <laughs> one of his best friends got into a dispute with Vito Rizzuto, and from my reporting, Rizzuto's decision to kill this guy. Um, I think it was in 06, Pretty shortly either before or shortly after Rizzuto was locked up for the first time in Canada. He didn't get, I don't think he got shipped to the U S until later in the two thousands. Mm-hmm. But I think at first he was locked up in a, um, yeah. In a, uh, prison in Canada. Yeah. And I think it was in the mid two thousands and he, he ordered this guy killed. And that is what t- was the first straw, at least in turning Desjardins, Desjardins against Vito Rizzuto. And for people that don't know, A, I would recommend uh, going to watch the, the FX docuseries called Bad Blood with Paul Sorvino, Anthony LaPaglia. Uh, LaPaglia. Yeah, and, and um, uh, 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 um, Jan Kim, Co- uh, Kim Coates. Kim, Co- Kim Coates. From Sons of Anarchy. From Sons of, Sons of Anarchy. Uh, it does a good job, I think, of, it's a fictionalized version of the war, but uh, I think it does a good job of breaking that down. But he the 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 character that he plays is a loose interpretation of Desjardins Desjardins, um, who was this French Canadian gangster. Parlez-vous français? <laughs> no, this French Canadian <laughs> gangster that had that had uh, risen to be um, Vito Rizzuto's right hand man, and then when Vito Rizzuto went to prison, Desjardins Desjardins flipped on him. Uh, and joined forces with Salvatore Montagna, and then they, and then they, and then they fell out. They fell out, <laughs> right? So. It gets confusing. But there's some really good reporting on. I mean, we we've both admitted we're not we're not the foremost experts on Canada, although we find it fascinating and like to talk about it. Um, it's it's inevitable. We we got something wrong, and someone will, Peter someone Peter, will point it out on social media. Peter Edwards, you fucking dummies. <laughs> Uh, Peter but we Ed- do our best. Peter Edwards, Paul Cherry, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Antonio I mean. Nicasso. Yeah. They, they do great James reporting. Dubro. There's some great uh, books on this subject. Yeah, Six Family. That's, that's like the One Bible. of the greatest books. Yeah, and then this uh, topic. the book that they wrote that they based Bad Blood off of. Um, uh, isn't it called Bad Blood? Isn't that the book? It's not called Bad Blood. It's called something like... Bi- I, I, I know what you're talking about. That it was might like be called. It might be called Bad Blood, and then there's a subtitle. Yeah, that's a good yeah. book too. So and uh, the, and the 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 guy who writes about the bikers too. I've read quite a few of yeah. his books. Um, fuck, I can't think of his name, but he he wrote Fallen Angel, I think. I if you told me the name, I'd write. And that. Showdown, which is about like the outlaws yeah. and, and Hamilton. Um, so there's you can look it up. You can Google it. There's some really good books on and reporting on on Canadian organized crime. Well, this was fun. Let's uh, once again give props to our. Producer on the wheels of steel, uh, behind the glass, making those ones and twos sing like he's Jam Master J or Mix Master Mike. Uh, our boy Ben, who's been taking us to the next level. 
thank you to the audience. And, uh, you know, we love giving you kind of this potpourri of, uh, of modern day, historical, pop culture, Italians, African-Americans, bikers, Jews. Cartels, Irish. Yeah. So uh, we, don't just, we don't just talk about New York Italian yeah, mafia guys every episode like other we like other to, shows. We, lo- we love to mix it up. <laughs> And uh, Throw we that know, shade. Throw that shade, James. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that, that people love the biker stuff. And uh, there's just so much, so much, so much, so much of a rich palette to paint from when you're talking about telling stories from the biker world, both, uh, oh, like I, I said, I historically and even what's going on today. And uh, I think we'll, we'll do an episode coming up. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of pagans stuff uh, in the blue wave, but uh, there's, there's some good. Uh, outlaws um, stories that are out there. Uh, you got four separate murder cases involving the outlaws that are in different stages in the in the judicial process around the country. So maybe we'll uh, we'll do an episode on the outlaws uh, coming up. I'd at some like point to get somebody of... from you know we had a cast member from The Sopranos. Oh One yeah, of these days I'd love to Sons get someone from from Sons of Anarchy or Mayans yeah. MC. I've I've been shouting out Mayans MC on social media. And I uh, get a lot of positive response. And th- I love that show. Another aside, and I will go to my grave claiming this is one of the great, what I call good bad movies ever made about just period, but it's about biker culture. It's called Stone Cold. It's with Brian Bosworth. I know it's embar- <laughs> I know it's emb- it's embarrassing <laughs> that I would uh, I would recommend a movie Boz. with Brian Bosworth as the star character, but I really think uh, for, again, for uh, the way that I'm promoting it as a, a movie that was so bad, it was actually good. Uh, Brian Bosworth goes undercover into uh, a biker gang led by Lance uh, uh, Hen, um, Hen, uh, the guy from he's been in a bunch of things. Lance Hendrick, uh, Henrik, Hendrick. I'm blanking on his name. Oh, I know from like he was in uh, Alien. Uh, yeah, Aliens. Alien. Yeah, and uh, he he was in. He's been in a lot of stuff. A lot of horror, like yeah. Pumpkinhead. He's been in a lot of horror yeah, movies. Yeah, yeah. And he's great as the biker boss. Uh, they call Chains, and w- uh, William Forsyth is in it. Yeah, he's he's great. He's and uh, it's it's really cheesy. He's but, great, but it, it I think it actually gives you a pretty decent, uh, accurate look at what some of those guys are like. And even though it's a cheesy, a cheesy '80s movie, I would recommend it for uh, you know that kind of uh, uh, exploitation type films. Go check it out, Stone Cold, starring Brian Bosworth, the boss. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, thanks to Ben, thanks to the audience for uh, Jimmy Bucciolato. This is Scott Bernstein. Please like, subscribe, follow. We'll keep giving you the content you love. We'll see you next week. OJ, po- uh, OJ, OG o- o- podcast. You're thinking, fo- you're thinking of football, OJ. <laughs> <laughs> OG podcast out. <laughs>